There we go. Hi, Tarek. Hi, Yumna. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. It's good to see you. I'm glad that you have internet. Yeah, I'm glad that too. And I'm sorry for the darkness because we don't understand just some light. How do you light your home these days? Is it just by candlelight or torchlight? We we basically use candle, but sometimes we have small batteries. We can charge them on the pet and the car's batteries, so they can light us for a few hours. But the light is go on so quickly, mm -hmm. and, and charge it often. And we have any source of clean power to mm -hmm. charge batteries. Once but I'm glad. Sorry, I'm not, sorry. No, Bad go ahead, that, please. Yeah, I'm glad for for that. You, you, you just a little of light. That means that I'm lucky. Mm. But other houses and in other people houses, they don't even have any source of. Power. They fall. They live in completely darkness, and they. Mm -hmm. They even maybe have no candle to light in this darkness. And with the sound of the drones, you may hear them mm -hmm. now. And you will, I, it's, you will absolutely hear some bombs during this line because every couple of minutes is really targeted some places here and here next to us and around in this area. You will hear that sound, I, I believe. Yeah. So with these around people with the darkness, that makes them, I don't know how they do feel inside their homes with all these. And Tarek, for those, for those of you who are joining us and for those who don't know, um, Tarek is in Khan Yunus. So that's in the southern Gaza Strip. And that is the area that Israel has told millions over a million Palestinians from North Gaza to evacuate to for safety. But as Tarek just said, there, and you can probably hear when Tarek's speaking, there's the constant hum. It's not really a hum. It's just a really loud noise. There's a constant sound of drones, Israeli drones flying overhead. And as Tarek said, there's constant airstrikes happening around. And that's in, in Khan Yunus where it's supposed to be safe. Um, Tarek, someone just asked, how, how was it with the rain today? We saw the news that it was heavily raining in Gaza. Um, I'm sure that has impacted things greatly on the ground. People are sleeping on, in the streets and in shelters. So how did the rain impact things today? Yeah, I'm actually writing a story about that. But the people who are evacuated to the schools and to the hospitals, and they are now living in tents, they just face some harsh conditions right now. They got wet by the rain and they have no other option to go. They have no places to hide from the rain and they have no shelter from the rain. So for for the first time in our life, in the history, people in Gaza do not want this rain to to continue. They are always asking for rain they, because it's good sign for people. But in the meantime, in this circumstances where people are facing the hard cold, I'm hearing some families. And by the way, we have to mention mm -hmm. some important thing. When people evacuated their homes from Gaza City and the north, it wasn't winter. It wasn't cold. It was hot weather and it was like like summer we can say so they evacuated the homes with some clothes that are not prepared for the winter and the cold now they don't have a new clothes because and some families do not have the fun to get a new clothes because prices in Hanyun is i I will not be honest if I say doubled or troubled, they got even higher. So, yeah. and even found their children. Today, today, I just, a call from a woman 
in school, she sent me a message saying that she had seven kids and they all evacuated from my neighborhood, from my Shijahiyya. She said that last night from 5 a.m. when the rain started to fall, they all get wet and they all, especially the children, they get shaking and keep shaking to the afternoon and they have to wait the sun to sit on the sun to get their clothes dry. They have one of two choices. The first is to wait the sun and the second is to get off all of their clothes and put it in a way to get dry. And these are both these choices are very harsh for people to handle and to do, to deal with. So they ask him, so they ask him some clothes, they ask him about any way to get clothes, the clothes dry or, or things like that. So the rain just doubled the crisis. The rain make people suffer more. And we, I can't imagine that I'm saying that the rain in Gaza make people suffer yeah. more. Um, Can you, yeah, it's, it's harsh for people to deal with, and we we are we are speaking about one million about one million people who evacuated from Gaza City and its north, and now are settling here in Khanunis and some places in the southern Gaza. So everything everything is harsh. Everything you can't imagine how life is suddenly turned for Palestinians, for people in Gaza, how the conditions become to be and how everything changed in one second, in a couple of days, all lives of all people just changed for the worse. Now they are thinking of death in any of its way, if not from the Israeli bombardment, then maybe from starvation. If not, maybe the cold. If not, maybe the ink and the and the flood that that contain in the in the areas that they live. Yeah. And some have nothing to cover their head when they're sleeping, when they're walking, they sleep on the pavement next to the Norwa schools because there's no space inside the school. Mm-hmm. Tar and Tarek, you've so I just want to let people know who are just joining us. Tarek is joining us from Khan Yunus in southern Gaza, and he was just telling us about um, the rain that Gaza saw today and how the the levels of rain um, are actually impacting people for the worse because many people are sheltering in the streets or without, you know, any, any shelter. But Tark, I know you've reported on this before, before this latest attack on Gaza, about how, you know, Gaza's infrastructure was very ill-equipped for the winter time, for, for heavy rain, for floods, for the cold. And, and now, I mean, with so many people who have been, you know, made homeless by the latest Israeli bombardment, I'm sure that problem has multiplied, you know, by, I don't even, I would honestly say a million. Now all of these problems just get worse and worse because Israel, in the meantime, targets them, the infrastructures in the south of Gaza as well the Gaza Strip and the North. And if we have in the a flood, floodings in some areas, now with the continuous rain, every place in Gaza will get floods. Every place, maybe homes as well. Mm-hmm. But now we're talking about people who evacuated from their homes and got to south of Gaza in, in school, in some places that are not even prepared for people to live inside, like schools. Mm-hmm. People are living and sleeping in the yard of the school. Mm-hmm. Where are 
only under the sky and the dream because all the classes in the schools are full of people mm -hmm. we have to, uh, we're speaking to we're speaking about 70 people inside one classroom so with these numbers of people suffering is just getting more and double with all these circumstances. And Tarek, some people are asking. Um, so for those asking, Tarek is joining us from Khan Yunus. That's in southern Gaza. So Tarek is joining us from the area where um, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have been evacuated to for safety. And someone was asking, what is that buzzing sound that they can hear in the background whenever Tarek's speaking? And as Tarek mentioned at the beginning of this live stream, that is this constant sound of Israeli drones overhead Gaza. Tarek, can you tell us more about these drones and these sounds, you know, just aside from the bombing? What tell us about these drones that you hear all the time? Well, these drones are never leaving the sky. They are scanning the area, and every every small area got some maybe several drones above it to scan the area for everyone moving, every everything happening, targeting or collecting data for the 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 aircraft so these are responsible of scanning and sometimes they bump a small targets like someone in the car some someone in the motorcycle someone walking small targets by the drones but they are basically responsible for supporting the aircraft with data to target specific places they will they never leave they never leave the sky day and night every minute we have this sound and it is now it is it is manageable sometimes it is very noisy that we couldn't go to sleep we couldn't even hear each other when we speak next to each other we couldn't hear the sound of each other because it 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 getting it's getting loud and louder so these are the drones, and you are hearing as well the Israeli war plans going and getting back, going to maybe to Gaza, bomb Gaza, and getting back, and everything in the sky. The sky is full of drones, airplanes, and several things that Israeli use to bomb people in Gaza, and to now we are as we are speaking there are massacres committed inside and around a shifa hospital can you to, tell us can you tell us more about what's happening right now at shifa hospital i know yeah, uh, yes, people sure. have been asking yes sure now we have inside a shifa hospital 1050 from the medical staff who refused to leave their patients and evacuate a Shiva hospital. And there are 7,000 patients. Most of them are injuries from this war. They couldn't leave the Shiva hospital because of their injuries. Maybe they, I don't know their condition exactly, what, what are their conditions, but we can imagine that those people who couldn't evacuate, maybe because they have several injuries in their bodies and they can't move from one place to another so the medical staff decided to stay Be they decided to keep their duties because this is their duties to treat patients so they all stay in ship hospital but the israel tanks and airstrikes are targeting the surrounding area of hospitals and inside a Shifa hospital, everyone moves or get close to the window. Snipers shoot him dead. Everyone try to get out of the doors, of the building door, doors that they are locked in. 
Israeli snipers will shoot him dead. Many people tried to evacuate a Shifa hospital during the past two days, but they were killed as they attempt to as they attempt to do so. Now Israeli soldiers on the ground want to storm a Shifa hospital. Tomorrow you will hear massacres committed by Israeli soldiers inside a Shifa hospital because tonight they will storm a Shifa hospital because thousands of airstrikes just reported from Shiva hospitals. There are some people inside the Shiva hospitals who are able to get messages out of the Shiva hospitals. Mm -hmm. And the, the health ministry spoke person, Ashraf al-Qadr, is inside. And he was just, Al Jazeera just had a call with him two hours, three hours ago. Mm -hmm. And he was speaking about a catastrophe inside the Shiva hospital. They had to make a collective grave to over 200 people only because they they got they they killed days ago and they were in the in the yard of a ship hospitals and they are afraid of diseases to expand it from these bodies and also animals and birds are getting to them in the day and night and eat or do what they do from for the for these bodies so in in the hospital tonight they are focusing on hospitals and they are doing what they are coming to do they want to destroy ship hospital they want to kill everyone inside and i don't believe when they reach to the doctors and patients they will tolerate with them and they deal with them gently or even human in a humanitarian way no they will kill them just like the you sent me earlier they pretended to the israeli soldiers pretended to help them in front of the cameras and one couple of meters away from the cameras they kill him and leave him bleed to die so i believe tomorrow morning we will hear about these massacres that now are committed inside the ship hospital. Yeah. Thank you, Tark. I don't. I mean, I don't know what to say for those of you who are joining us. Tark was just telling us that he's getting reports right now of um, like heavy Israeli bombardments around the Ashifa hospital area. And just to answer some of the questions that people have been leaving in the comments, no, Ashifa hospital is not empty. It has not been empty, despite what maybe we are hearing in the media as, as Tarek's, you know, Israel is really pushing this narrative that it has done everything it can to evacuate, you know, safely evacuate the hospitals and evacuate people. But as Tarek was saying, there are still thousands of people stuck inside Ashifa hospital and inside other hospitals in northern Gaza um, because those who there was a mass exodus of people from northern Gaza over the weekend. Those who were did not leave over the weekend have essentially been trapped over the past few days. Um, and have been unable to leave the grounds of the hospital because health officials, doctors, medical staff in the hospital say that they're being targeted um, by Israeli sniper fire and Israeli artillery. They say that tanks and Israeli ground troops are stationed just several hundred meters away from the hospital and are surrounding it. Um, so we're keeping an eye on, on what's happening now um, in Shifa Hospital. And as, as Tariq was saying, it's not just that, you know, um, Israeli troops are targeting Shifa Hospital. And, you know, there are thousands of patients and also people, like families of patients and people who are sheltering inside the hospital. The hospital isn't functioning, right, Tariq? Like there's the, the statements that we've been reading from the Ministry of Health say there's, you know, no power, there's no food, there's no water, they're out of medical supplies. The doctors are saying the hospital is non-functional. Basically, all they're doing is just basic first aid. But, as, you know, right now, essentially, patients like ICU patients and even some babies from the NICU are dying because they can't get any treatment. Yeah, you're right. And you can imagine that, that all these 
those doctors who are working and caring about patients for now, let's say for a week, they have no water and they have no food. So they are working under pressure and under the Israeli continuous bombardment and under all of this fear without even food, without water. So this is really a catastrophe. And, you know, someone just left a comment asking about, you know, the medical waste to, is it possible to get the medical waste out of Shifa Hospital to prevent an epidemic? No. But that's, right. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. Yeah. We have some doctors saying that the disease will just expand it in, inside the Shifa Hospital because of the waste. The waste are melting and melting inside the corridors of the Shifa Hospitals. They have no way to get it out of the entrance of the building they are inside because when they try once, the Israeli snipers just shoot one of the the workers, shoot him dead. So anything that try to get out of the building, now I have to say, Ashifa Hospitals is a, a place, a great and huge place and contains seven buildings, seven large buildings. Every building is specialized with something like heart diseases in a building and so on. Now, all the patients and all the doctors inside two buildings, only two of them. Israeli snipers just surrounded all these buildings because they know, of course, the people in people inside the hospital are inside these two buildings, so they are targeting. If the if the window moves from someone trying to have a look what is going on outside the hospital, the one who moves the window just fall that. If the door get opened for anyone to get out the waste or to get resupplied from water or food from anything from anyone also the is bumped from the drones and the snipers so you can imagine inside these two buildings patients dog mountain of, of waste and everything in the same place and despite all these challenges and circumstances doctors just giving their best to care about patients inside Shiva store. And as I think some people are writing in the comments, and I just saw this as well on Al Jazeera's website, that they reported, as Tarek said, that the health ministry spokesperson, Ashraf al-Qudra, has said that the Israelis contacted a Palestinian health official and said they will raid the hospital in the coming minutes. And they told us to inform everybody not to be near the windows. So as Tarek said, we are likely going to witness great atrocities happen tonight in the coming minutes as Israeli ground forces plan on raiding a Shifa hospital. As Tarek has been saying over the past several minutes that this hospital is not empty. The hospital is not empty. It is full of sick men, women, and children doctors, medical staff, people, <clears throat> heroes, families who have stayed behind because they cannot leave because they have family who are too injured and too sick to be evacuated. For days, health officials have pleaded with, for coordination with the International Red Cross for safe ways to evacuate patients. Of course, Israel has said that, you know, we've opened up these humanitarian quarters and that's how we're go that's how we're safely getting the people out. But as Tarek said, as we've been seeing reports of these humanitarian corridors are not safe. People are still coming under fire from Israeli forces as they try to evacuate along these safe routes. And many of the health officials, the health officials in Gaza and inside the Shifa Hospital, have said that their patients will not survive the journey to the south. There are so many sick and injured people 
into a hospital, even if they were to transport them along these safe routes, they wouldn't survive. And so that's why so many of these doctors and medical staff, and you have so many patients who haven't left the hospital. So, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in the coming minutes, but we do know that for weeks, Israel has perpetuated this narrative that there is a Hamas command center underneath the Shifa hospital. And that is why it needs to target the hospital. Tariq, you wrote an article about this yesterday, you know, about the hospital and also about the, the sort of ways that Israel has used this narrative to justify its targeting of hospitals. Can you tell us more about this, this narrative specifically and what doctors and health officials in Gaza have said um, contradicting those Israeli claims? Well, you know, the Israeli army claims that there are commander room under the Shifa hospital and inside tunnels related to Hamas and other factions under a Shifa and Arantisi hospital. Mm -hmm. But doctors and spokesperson of the Shifa hospital say that, okay, if these are the Israeli claims. Let 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 us host an uh, an international committee to come to a Shifa hospital and look inside a Shifa hospital and decide whether we have these claims right or not. They they meant and I mean international international researcher international any 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 international body but not in this way not to bomb a Shifa hospital not to kill everyone inside the Shifa hospital but israel rejects these camp okay the reject the doctor's peep today i watch a video to an israeli soldier inside arantisi hospital he was talking about a schedule for medical staff and saying that this is uh, these are the names of the terrorists and there we there there in this place they used to or they were keeping the hostage but he was wrong he was completely wrong because the the schedules the schedule on the wall was about the shifts of the nurse and doctors inside a shifa inside a, a rotis hospital there it was in arabic language and he was claiming that these are the names of the terrorists the 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 letter and words in the schedule was the day of the weeks sunday monday and so on there were no names. So this is an example for the, for the Israeli claim. They are baseless. And if they, if they want, a, if they have some intelligence, information about, about room, commander room under the Shifa hospital, why they didn't accept for an international committee to come and fix that, to come and look at that bombing a place such a place like a ship it's a huge place to get bombed they they will they will execute hundreds of people thousands of people inside and outside outside the ship hospital would now the hospital get out there will be no place for people in gaza to go to when they, they seek treatment but these claims are are, are are baseless so far and they now they are okay let's wait, wait until the morning they will invade and raid the hospital in the morning and i'm sure they will find nothing and they do i i mean if their claims are are going on for weeks if there are anything under hospitals they could evacuate but even so they will 
see signs of places. For now, I don't know how they will how they will tour of there is a command room inside or under the ship hospital. So okay now they are the there are news just warning from massacres inside the hospital from the media office government. But what does the statement say? They will Sorry, sorry, you cut out for a second, but I hope that people were um, were able to hear what you said. But Tarek has said that you know the the Gaza media office is saying now that they're warning of massacres, imminent massacres, um, at the the Shifa Hospital, which, according to reports, is under imminent threat of being raided by Israeli ground forces. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, Tarek is with us. As you can see, he's lit by candlelight yeah. because um, I guess, Tarek, that's how you, that's your electricity these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah when's, that's it. When's the last time that you had like a real like electricity or like power in your house? And October. October, in the first week of October. That was, that was the last time you've had like proper electricity. Yeah. yeah. And also, even before that, it wasn't proper electricity. Yeah. I mean, can you tell? Six hours in, in the day. And sometimes we, when we get lucky, we got eight hours in, in, in every day. And so can you tell as we, you know, we're going to, everyone, we're going to keep following the, um, the updates from Ashifa Hospital. And whenever there's an update, Tarek will let us know, hopefully, as long as we have this internet connection. But Tarek, can you tell viewers, like, something that I've found to be really eye-opening and helpful for me to understand, like, what your everyday reality is like? Are these, you know, just small messages or small things that you'll tell us of how you charge your phone, how people take a shower or go to the bathroom or how you have to find food or water, um, like how you get electricity, all of these things. Can you tell us like, can you tell us what a typical day looks like for you? Um, like when you wake up in the morning until the, the nighttime? Yeah. The bad thing that these days I just don't want to get up because when I get up, a journey of suffering starts. A journey of real suffering. Um, I'm speaking about suffering when you go to the when you wake up and go to the bathroom. You don't find water to wash your face. This is a new level of suffering here in Gaza. We, I, I mean. We live the worst conditions in the world, but we were managed. We we have source of water. We have some short hours of power every day. We don't face this these circumstances ever. To walk up and go to the bathroom, you don't find water. Then you get out of the bathroom, looking, asking everyone in your home. In, inside this home, hey, do you have some water to wash my in my face? No, you can find with someone else. And I go to anybody else asking. Imagine that sometimes we ask neighbor, we ask neighbor only to get water to wash our to wash our face. This is this is the first half an hour of our waking up. And then we start a new journey, securing food. So we have, I have to go to the yard of this home and find some wood or some papers, some carton or something, any, anything to light a small fire so I can make some, some breakfast. Sometimes we miss the breakfast because I, 
I I don't wake up in the mood to make all this stuff and make a fire in the morning. So we missed breakfast. We say, okay, we will make one fire beer day and we make a uh, we we will prepare one new meal so and we will stand for the long day on it because we cannot do fire three times or two times in the day. When we were well in the first weeks of of our evacuation here in Khan Yunus, cars and vehicles used to have food so they can move. They can they could get us some water and use the food to get it up on the roof in the storage of water. But now recently we are speaking about four days in the past, these vehicles stopped and we called them and go to their home asking for water and they say if you supply me with food I will come to your home. It means it's impossible to come to your home because we don't have a cooking gas to make a cup of tea. And the food sometimes we have something sometimes we have to go out to bring some some vernacular and some can something any anything to eat it's i don't know how to express this but i feel that like that we are losing our humanity day by another we are losing everything that connected us to the world connected everything that make us feel that we are a human like anyone else in this world because i don't know how it feels when you are suffering only to prepare a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a breakfast or do or, or even boil water to make milk milk to your children you will have to suffer to do that it is not easy and it's not manageable it is it's really hard job to do and some days when we got so lucky and get someone with water outside our home and we need to get it upstairs to the fourth floor we do it by our hand so me and the young people in the home we get prepared alone we fill it from here down and hold it to the fourth floor and put it down in the in our storage so we can open so we can go to the bathroom and find water and all this process all the long day of work to get water next day the water is gone we were desperate this water so everyone get shower everyone clean himself everyone we get our clothes clean because even even i mean when we evacuate we didn't get all of our clothes we didn't we didn't know that it will take that long and we will stay away from our homes that long we thought that we will keep close to our home and we will go to it get our stuff and get back to the safe place but i never i myself i never imagined that we will evacuate all of gaza city i first moved from shijaya neighborhood to azaytun neighborhood and then from azaytun neighborhood to khanunis so this scenario wasn't even crossing my mind at the beginning of the war we thought okay israel will keep its bombardment and will keep air strikes on targets affiliated to Hamas but we didn't thought that civilians will suffer will suffer too and we will lose our home i mean i got my home bomb it completely destroyed and even if i'm in a close place to my home i wouldn't 
I wasn't able to get anything from even my clothes. So I, I have now to get a new clothes. With these prices, I, as I mentioned in the beginning of this slide, the prices that got higher on the sky. Well, let's say that I can do that, but there are, are 60 percent of people in Gaza and these are official statistics 60 percent of residential units in Gaza are destroyed so imagine how many people were living inside it and now turned homeless and all of them need everything in you and don't forget about the shift between the sun and winter that have been in the middle of all this war. So it is suffering even to have this cup of coffee that I'm drinking. I consider myself lucky to have coffee. When when the coffee I have in my home gone and ended when when it finished, I was not able to get a new coffee because there's no coffee in the supermarkets. There's no anything in the supermarket. I don't know. This is this is the current situation, and the problem is it is going. It is getting worse and worse every day, and the day and other. So yeah, that's it. That's our daily life. Dark, shortage of everything, starvation cold, bombardment, killing, death. And even the main subject and the main talk in everybody has about killing. When, when anyone around me see, say the sentence of, do you know X people, do you know X? Automatically, I figured out that he just Kill. He just get killed. So I become now. I hate to hear about this sentence. Do you know X? Do you know Muhammad? Yes. What happened to him? He just killed. Do you know Fatima? Yeah, she just killed. This is the day we live, and it is repeatedly, and every day just looks like the next. But with more crisis, with more suffering, but the basic subject and the basic things that happen every day is still the same. Killing, starvation, the people don't get access to water. So even if, I mean, on top of like worrying Every minute, if you're going to be bombed or if your house is going to be targeted next, like every day is a constant struggle just to find the most basic things like food, water, something so simple, like that we all take for granted, like a cup of coffee is like you said, it's like you're one of the lucky ones just to have yeah. like a small, small little cup of coffee. Yeah. But like, people have been asking about like the humanitarian aid situation. And but before I go into the next question, Tarek, I know you have a limited amount of internet, so I don't want to use up all your internet. Um, tell me how much more time do you think you'll be able to do this for? Five minutes, 10 minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes, maybe. 10 minutes? Okay. And if you need to go before that, that's also okay. But um, I want to ask... Uh, uh, people have been asking in the chat about the humanitarian aid. And so we know like on October 7th, after, uh, since this all started, Israel imposed a, com you know, Israel was already besieging Gaza, but it tightened the siege on Gaza and completely stopped the entrance of fuel and humanitarian aid. In recent weeks, it's let just a trickling in of aid, maybe a dozen trucks, several dozen trucks a day compared to I believe, Tarek, was it 500 trucks a day that were coming before October 7th into Gaza? And yes. so um, 
what's the situation now? I mean, you have millions of people who are in similar situations or worse situations than yours um, that are homeless and don't have access to food, water, um, or anything and are relying on humanitarian aid. What's the, what's the aid situation like? Are people getting aid? Is the aid enough for all the people in Gaza who need it? No, no, no at all. Look, we get, we used to the Rafah cross and, uh, and the Israel crossing that that used to allow aid to enter Gaza from both sides before this war, we received, as you mentioned, 500 tanks of aid every day. Now, from the beginning of this war, so far until now, only from 70 to 100 tanks could enter Gaza Strip. Now, with this number, Numbers, you can imagine what is the situation of aid inside Gaza. But I, I watched some videos, and they were they were heartbreaking videos. A humanitarian aid tank was was on the road, and it's supposed to distribute it to people, but thousands of people stormed this tank because they believe that not everyone will get this aid. So the faster one or the one who will fight and get some water from this aid and some cans of food and and something like that, he will gain it. And if he, he give away or, or stand away to wait turn, he will not get anything. So the scenes of these people who storming this tank and get whatever they could to take, that was reflect how much people are suffering and how and how far they are from the aid to reach them. Well, you know, I have three brothers inside the European, the European hospital in Khan Yunus. And they are like thousands, they are like one million people who are displaced and wait to receive some aid from the UNRWA or any official, any official body. They say that they receive the minimum of their needs and not every day. They receive something like toilet paper. While they don't need toilet paper because there is no toilet to use. They receive some rice. What they should do with rice without any source of power to, to cook for their children. They use, they, they receive some cans. Let's say about hummus and these kind of stuff that in steel cans to use. Okay, these are helpful, but no bread, no water, and you no know, enough water for, for this family. They, ha they, they give every family like two, three liters of water per day, drinking water. It's not enough. So it's like a drop of everything in a in a hungry mouth and open as much as, as can yeah. all of this aid that entered gaza so far we we didn't we didn't realize it because it is not that yeah. much that's the reason I can't say and i can't say that there is aid inside gaza there is aid entered to gaza all of the aid that the Arab countries and the European countries and Turkey and some other countries are sending to Gaza are loaded in Al Arish city in, inside Egypt. In waiting to the Israeli side to allow that enter Gaza. And here you can imagine 
a country like Egypt do not have the power to let the aid enter to Gaza Strip, they they need Israeli permission to support their their sisters and their brother their brothers in Gaza and their families inside Gaza. So here we are surrounded from all the places with people who cannot offer help. Everyone say that we are supporting Gaza, but on the ground, no one support people. No one support hungry people who are left their homes and left everything behind. They lose their homeland. Now Gaza is again occupied. Now no one can get back to Gaza because if they do, they will get killed immediately. There are new Israeli checkpoints that this, that separate from the south and the north of Gaza. So when we speak about aid, I can honestly say that there's no aid on the ground. I only can say there's a real aid for people on the ground. When I see everyone get its need, it's enough to need food and water and clothes. They need to get clothes because, as I mentioned, they get shifted from the summer to the winter while they are out of their homes. So I can say there's no aid. There's no aid. And if, okay, there's no aid, you know. Yeah. There's, no, there's nothing that people receive that get get their dignity saved and preserved. And even and these, like what you said, even what is coming in, the little bit of aid that's coming in is not really addressing the vast needs that people have because without fuel or without a home, you know, you can't cook a bag of raw rice without water. You can't use toilet paper or soap to go take a shower. Um, so, you know, the very essential things that people need, fuel, shelter, water, um, those things are, are not there. Yeah. Tarek, I don't want to take up, um, more of your, internet connection. So folks, I think we're going to start wrapping up because as many of you know, and you can see Tarek does not have power. He's not connected to Wi-Fi. So he's speaking to us now from um, data on an eSIM card um, that, you know, Tarek has, has managed to get from, from different groups. And that's how he mostly communicates with us. And Basically, it's whenever, Tarek, whenever you're able to get an internet connection that you're able to to speak with us. But if your internet runs out, then once again, your communications are are cut off. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Yumna, I have to say that I'm thankful that we will end this life without me getting pumped because every time I write something or I go, I have to speak with you, giving you reports from the ground, I feel that in any second, they will send a muscle to my home to kill me and kill anyone around. That, because you know, they killed dozens of journalists in Gaza who were just telling the world about their crimes inside Gaza, their crimes against humans and humanity in Gaza. And to be honest, I feel that fear that they may get me and everyone around me. So I am I consider myself again lucky one more time that I will finish this life and go to sleep safely and next to my family without getting killed. Tarek, we're praying for your safety. We're glad that you are still alive and that you're here with us and that you have your your family with you and we pray that it stays that way and that we can see an end to this violence soon. Tarek, is there anything that you'd like to say to the the people that are watching before we sign off? Yeah, of course. Use your voices and speak loud, please. Put pressure on your government. If you are Americans or Britain or any 
or in any place that support Israel, its government, I mean, support Israel and its war against civilians in Gaza, just please put as much as as much pressure as you can on your government to stop this genocide against our people in Gaza. Because I believe that you have voices and you can speak out loud. You can go to the White House and tell the administration that you are killing children. You killed over 5,000 kids in Gaza and you injured over 20,000 kids inside Gaza. Just speak on behalf of all these children and all these innocent people who got killed in this war and tell the world that this must this must end. This must end as soon as possible. Because every day this war keep going. Hundreds of people got killed. Hundreds of innocent people got killed. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. And we hope that we will be able to do another one of these live streams soon. If you want to keep following Tarek's coverage, I recommend following him on social media. His Instagram handle here is um, in the chat. It's Tarek S. Hajaj. Um, and Tarek, that's your same handle on Twitter as well, right? So that's this is Tarek's username, Tarek S. Hajaj. This is his username for Instagram and Twitter. So you can follow Tarek on social media for more updates. And of course, please continue to read Mondoweiss and follow our work on our website and our social media channels to hear more updates from Tarek on the ground in Gaza, as well as more stories from Palestine and from the U.S. as we continue to watch this genocide unfold in Gaza. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. And we hope that we'll see you again soon with Tarek. Thank you. Good night, Tom. Thank you. Good night. Bye.